I'm Richard, I'm in London, and I'm as headless as they come, and uh, enjoying being spaced with this experience. We, we don't have uh, an agenda, and we're here as friends. Everybody I know, not everybody knows each other, by the way, and we are here just to share our experience of living the headless way. We don't know anything more about it than you, but we are very happy to share our response to this wonderful openness uh, where we are. And so that's why I'm here. And it's marvelous to have friends that, to share this with. It's just infectious, inspiring, fun. And we haven't, uh, all of us haven't, uh, some of us haven't done this before. I've just done it once before. So, um, okay, Jose and Lorraine, would you like just to say something? Yeah, okay. okay. Hello, uh, my name is Lorraine. I live in Paris. And uh, I know this way from uh, for uh, 24 years. I was 20 when I met Douglas. And uh, I share this uh, practice uh, with, with Jose at home and we do workshop in summer in France. And uh, I'm also a teacher, a teacher for children. I don't speak very well English. I, I hope Jose will help me to, to say what I have to say. <laughs> uh, okay, so. Yes, uh, so I'm Jose, uh, we are in Paris. Um, I, uh, my, my job is to teach philosophy. Um, I met to Plus Harding uh, in 93. Um, when he came in Paris for a workshop. Um, I discovered the space here one year before uh, in reading a book of Nizagadatta Maharaj. The book is I Am That. Maybe you know, you know the book. It's, it's a masterpiece. So I discovered the space um, um, thanks to Nizagadatta Maharaj. But one year after I met Rupas and it was so important to to attend to one of his workshop first and to see um, his marvelous experiment. Um, because thanks to this experiment, I was able to, to maybe integrate the seeing in my life and I was able to share it with, with friends. So um, I've been sharing uh, headlessness now for 25 years. Uh, we receive people here twice a month and I, I do workshop uh, in France, in Belgium, in Switzerland. So but we are very happy to be here with you. Thank you. Very nice. Yes. Very nice. <laughs> Marvelous. Well, since we've just done one couple, Karen and Amarnata, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm uh, Karen. I'm from Holland. I'm doing the Headless Way about 10 years, I think. Discovered by grace and uh, well, it's the center of my life. It's uh, lovely, yeah. So uh, my name's uh, Amarnato, I'm English. I live in the Netherlands and I um, come across the Headless Way when I was a Buddhist monk and uh, met uh, Douglas and his wife Catherine about uh, 20 years ago, yeah. and. Uh, it's been an important part of my life ever since. It's very nice to meet you all. Wonderful. And now Amir and Jade. So I'm Amir. Um, I was introduced to Headless Way stuff through doing a course called the Finders Course, which featured Richard and um, found it very profound straight away and uh, then discovered the various online meetups and as a, the um, the kind of uh, retreat that Judy organizes and have also been organizing some courses and workshops with Richard for different communities that I'm involved with. So yeah, it's played a part in my life for the last couple of years now. Hi, I'm Jade. I have been headless for like six months now, um, introduced by Amir um, and I've done a few of Richard's courses as well. Um, so yeah, but I'm also based in London. Thank you. Uh, and why not uh, Jade and Christine? Hi, um, I'm Christine and uh, I live in Maui. I've really, really benefited from the Headless Way. Um, it's been an integral part of my life for several years, I think since 2004 or so, I'm guessing. 
Um, and my daughter Jade is here. So we've got two Jades. Um, so she's she can introduce herself. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jade. I'm from Maui as well. Um, my mom took me to one of the workshops over the summer in Oregon, and we learned a lot about the headless ways. So um, I've been sort of involved for about four years now. Thank <laughs> you. And let's see, Becky. Hi, um, I'm Becky. I'm in New York City, and um, I've been living. I started the Headless Way about a year ago in a course, like a mirror, and um, I've been going to the meetups. And Headless feels normal now. Feels really good. It feels normal. Yeah, I'm so glad to be here, um, sharing it with you. Welcome. Thank you. Sequoia? Yes, my name is Sequoia. I live on the Oregon coast in the United States and have been um, aware of my true nature now for probably, I don't know, 10, 10 11 years and um, have attended meetings regularly with Richard and now um, organize the American gathering every year in um, here in the U.S., usually in Oregon on the coast. So um, headlessness has shifted the entire experience of how the world shows up. So it's the most precious thing. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Judy? Hello, everyone. It's really great to see all these people from everywhere all around the world. Um, my, uh, I first met Douglas uh, a very long time ago, about the same time as Richard, and um, I kept in touch, uh, visited his place a lot. Um, it changed my life, seeing uh, who I really am. Um, so I've, I've had periods of time when I thought I could never keep it up, but um, here I am still doing it. And what I, um, what I do is I do organize the Salisbury uh, summer gatherings, Salisbury in England. I am in Swansea in South Wales, and we have this super get together every year. It's been going on for 25 years. And um, yeah, everybody is invited to come, but perhaps not this year because it might be cancelled. <laughs> Anyway, it's good to meet everyone. Thank you, Judy. Hank? Hi, I'm Hank. I'm in Portland, Oregon. Been living the headless way for a number of years. It's good to be here with friends. And John? I live near Oxford in England, and um, uh, I I was given Douglas's uh, on having no head book for my 21st birthday. Okay, and uh, that was brilliant. And um, uh, I, I uh, run uh, workshops, online workshops on a Monday on the, Zoom, on the Zoom platform. Thank you. Great. So, Amir and Jade, any questions that jump out at you there? Yeah, we'll start with the topical one from Vikas. Uh, apologies, anyone, if I pronounce your name incorrectly. Um, I would like to ask how seeing helps you in these days of massive anxiety and fear all over the world because of coronavirus. Thank you, Vikas from Slovenia. Yes, I thought that question would come up. Anyone got a response coming up? I'm just going to... Yeah, I, I do. Um, the answer to um, how this helps is one that I couldn't answer. I just know that it does. Um, that in the past, fear in situations like this, fear and anxiety would very much be forefront. And up and until this point in this um, worldwide um, challenge, there has been no fear, no anxiety, no stress over this at all. And so I know headlessness is um, the contributing factor to that. Thank you. Someone else? Yes, Christine. 
So <clears throat> this is really an, a question that's near and dear to my heart. And it also might be helpful in answering the headache question. So I'm going to answer both the headache question and the, the question with regard to the coronavirus and the fear and anxiety that's happening in our society. So um, recently, in, in October, I was diagnosed with cancer. And I found out that I had breast cancer through a routine mammogram that I just went to the doctor and she said, oh, it's time for your mammogram. And I ended up finding out that I had breast cancer and then um, found out that I had to have both breasts removed and just went through basically hell. Um, <laughs> if you can imagine, because I was always healthy, I've always been healthy and I just kept questioning, well, did I bring this on some way? Um, why is this happening to me? Um, it was awful. And um, I can really relate to pain and suffering happening, you know, in this body. But at the same time, the headless way helps me to place it. So even though it feels like it's happening and it, it's almost like a veil that covers over your outlook and perce perception because all you feel is pain, all you can feel is suffering. And until you can step back and be upstream of that and hold that suffering and hold that anxiety and pain and and even this, the, the cancer itself, I realized that the less I resisted, the more I could just kind of be with it and embrace it and, and love it without pushing it away so much. Because when I was pushing it away and resisting and trying to figure out answers, I would suffer more. And then being upstream of it, just kind of like, okay, I'm holding it in this space and it's almost like wings, like these wings of awareness were just holding me and I knew that I would ultimately be okay. Even though I, my body wasn't okay, I was ultimately always, always okay and fine. And I've lost my breasts, I no longer have anything. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm just going to show you. I have completely flat. <laughs> and uh, sorry to traumatize you if it's upsets you to see that, but that's my reality. And I realize now that I'm not my body. I'm not my thoughts. I'm not my feelings. I am what, uh, just a container for those. And Looking back, I'm built open for all of it. And I don't have to know the why, and I don't have to know the answers, and why is this happening is just a recipe for suffering because I've gone there over and over again. And it just, it just is. And it's part of like that whole Byron Katie thing of loving what is. So... Hmm. Thank you. John, did you, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I, it's, a, it's a kind of matter of scale from my point of view. Um, the, uh, the scale of this space here, you know, as these hands disappear into it, it's so vast, it's so vast, it's always there, okay? And um, whatever happens, you know, whether it be a panic or a you know, some you know, virus, pain, da da da, whatever happens, it, it arises in this space, but it's a matter of scale. This space is vast and uh, always there, and whatever arises will, will fall back uh, into, into that. And um, as, you, as you say, um, Christine, identifying with that openness, with that capacity, is what does it 
and, and you know, in, in that sense, we're kind of invulnerable. We meaning each of us from here. Yeah. That's my take. I'll say something then that um, my one of my reflections is that uh, the w knowing what is happening is is really uh, difficult to know what is going on with the virus and what to do. You know, I follow the advice I'm given. I feel anxiety and fear, or for, or for my loved ones. You know, uh, at the same time wonderfully I am aware of this space that we're, we're celebrating here which is real which I do know I don't know it I don't understand it but it's accessible I can can't see my head instead I'm looking at this open space and this uh, is reliable and real and safe and true uh, in the you know and it goes along with this uh, what I'm not quite sure what's going on and I'm not in control of but but to have this safety within one's life which uh, it doesn't mean I'm now, you know, uh, personally feel, not feeling anxious. I, I, in the midst of this kind of storm that's going on, is this stillness at the center that is just so wonderful. Uh, uh, and a bit like Sequoia, I don't understand it. I, I don't have to understand it, but I am it. And my, uh, uh, I, <clears throat> I remember Douglas Harding once saying, see this when it's easy but if you can if you can manage to see it when times are difficult that will impress itself on you even you know even more in a way well for me these are difficult times so my uh, my challenge is to see to have all this within me uh, and right you know this is the situation now let me see who I am uh, through this situation yeah Most of you sound as if you've had a, have made a permanent shift into headlessness. Has anyone experienced a back and forth before fully settling into it? Thanks from Asma from the UK. Wonderful question. Now, who, Judy. Judy and then Karen. Oh, well, settled into it. Uh, yes, I do. Um, most of the time. But absolutely back and forth, back and forth for years. Um, it's something that kind of grows on one, I find. And sometimes I have assiduously practiced and done all sorts of things to try and make myself remember to, to look here. Um, and other times uh, it's just happened because of life circumstances. I can't say much about the virus in the last question, but I can say something about everyday challenge um, with the person I live with because we had an example of that today um, where we got into an argument and I got carried away into um, you know the blame game we both did and so I was definitely not seeing and then we sat down and I said this is terrible and I made a determined effort to come back here and clear all that stuff and just listen. And what I found was that I got to know my friend um, in such a deep way that I never had before. We have actually been living together for, for more than 10 years. But, but um, I think, I don't think as a quality of listening and the rec my recognition of the other person there was so much deeper. And that was solely because I put my stuff to one side. It didn't seem, it wasn't getting me anywhere to, to be in my stuff. What was getting me somewhere was to be clear and receptive. And what I do find is that being, living the headless way means that whatever comes up um, can be a challenge, but it's also a lesson. It also deepens my understanding of people, myself, of life, of what it's like to be here now. And 
it was a very dramatic example of going from being in my little self to to being just the open self, the the big one, as we say in the card. All the all the words, different words that we use. Being who I really am, rather than who I think I am, or feel I am, or remember that I am, or even would like to be. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. Karen? Mm. Yes. Um... Uh, I think for my for my experience that you know to 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 reach some permanent state or permanent well yes state I think is the best word uh, was one of my fantasies uh, that that would happen like you know preferably a very positive one like a peaceful one and you know a blissful one and all of that and I'm so relieved actually. That that's not the case. That uh, what I found is this: there's this beautiful dance happening between uh, uh, being fully immersed in my uh, small self, as Douglas would probably call it, and then uh, finding the the way back home to the big one, uh, which is untouched by all of it. But um, to have yeah to have this movement back and forth back and forth like a dance and um the dance goes quicker i i i'm less lost uh, over the years in my in all t types of emotions and preferences and dislikes and all of it to find the way home so quickly quicker and quicker and quicker that's i think that's the benefits from uh, for me from the headless way and saying goodbye to the fantasy <laughs> thank you hank hi fine loren yes i find that the uh, back and forth is part of this almost intrinsic to seeing so whatever is going on, say I'm like Judy was talking about, say I'm having an argument with someone or having some kind of feeling. If I remember to look, then I look. Then I notice if there's any shift, if there's any difference. And whatever I notice is what I see. Thank you, Hank. Lauren? So uh, what I want to say is that uh, in my case, uh, at the beginning, I, I felt that there, is, there was something to do. And I think it's a classical thing to, 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 to think that there is something to do, something that we have to do. But uh, <laughs> what I discover is that uh, there is really nothing to do because uh, the, the, this space is uh, is only in you have to uh, to who mm, is it mm, rest to rest in that and uh, I think the, the the way is to see that there is nothing to do really it's always here and uh, uh, it's not a problem if some sometimes uh, you are not your attention is not on on this space because this space is uh, the, the the base of uh, of what you are so it's always here no, no it's not really a problem yes i agree with lauren i mean when when i discovered in fact that it was my true nature we don't really need to create something you know it's always there it's always open but you don't we, we don't uh, often we don't um uh, every time you look at it. So the question is how to come back. And thanks to Douglas' experiment, it's it's now simple to come back. That's a, that's the key, you know, I think uh, the key of this way. It's very simple to come back. It's like, uh, you know the way, you know, the way is looking here. You have to return your attention back. It's, it's very simple. 
and you don't need to go um, in a dojo for, for doing that. You don't um, need the place, a special place. It's always there, in fact. And, and maybe the way is to, to, to understand that. Maybe to practice is to, to understand that slowly. Thank you. Thank you. I would, I'd also agree that this is this is always here and the attention maybe get drawn off of it but but it's always there it's it's who this is expressing as at, at the core and so it can't go anywhere it's not going anywhere um where would it go <laughs> it occurs to me just to jump in and just say uh, an obvious thing is that uh, in, in our view, in my view, everyone gets this. What am I talking about? Look for your head, you can't see your head, instead you see the world, that's it. But it's a non-verbal experience. So I'm convinced we've all got it. It's not a feeling, it's not a thought, it's so simple and available. But we all express it differently, and there isn't a right way of expressing it. And your way, you know, people who are in the audience, so to speak, uh, is obviously as valid as ours. We're just friends here sharing our personal responses to this experience which is available to everyone. Yeah, you can't get it wrong and you can't do it better or worse. Yeah. All right, uh, Amir uh, and Jade, uh, something else jump out there? There's several questions that have come through that are quite similar in different ways, so I'll just read out uh, a, a few and then pe people can respond in the way they see fit. One from Max, question to the panel, does anyone practice being headless daily in some sort of prolonged, for example, 30 minute formal meditation? Um, and there's several people asking quite similar ones that they did a Vipassana retreat, but they're interested in replacing their regular practice with headless experiments, but they haven't yet got it. Do, they have, do you have any suggestions? Someone else who has a long-term practice for 30 to 40 minutes, they'd like to fill that time with headlessness instead. Um, of what they used to do and want some tips. So uh, Eden or Eden asking, how do I get into actual practice on being headless? Mm. The intro seems too general, hoping to get steps or links to actual practice workshops. And there's a few other questions on like technically how to, how to start. So maybe there's a way of combining answers to those. How is headlessness way different from meditation way? So that's kind of a, a broad summary of a group of questions. Marvelous. And do remember, Jade and Amir, you know, if you feel like responding, uh, I know you're on the job there, but, <laughs> you know. So do, does that uh, subject appeal to someone? Ah, Becky. Yeah, so um, there are actually uh, many things I do on a daily basis. And it doesn't take the same, I used to, I used to prior to Headless Way, I used to sit and meditate for hours. And this doesn't take the same form for me. Um, the first thing I do is when I walk the dogs, um, I always remember to be face to no face to people. So as someone's approaching me or coming in the direction that I'm in, I'll say it to myself, face to no face. I won't point, I live in New York City, I won't do that. But I will say it to myself. And sometimes I will have walked along, oh, I forgot to go face to no face. And I'll, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And that's all happening um, in my imagination. I'm not pointing, but I'm remembering. And then, um, then it's just the most natural thing in the world at that point. There's no head there. So all of this is happening in me. All of this. And it just comes up naturally. And then um, at some point during this walk, which my dogs are chihuahuas, it takes a whole block. Um, I'll have a conversation with somebody. And then sometimes I will remember to be, I'll remember the nature of being face to no face during the conversation. Or sometimes I'll remember afterwards that I forgot. And notice that the conversation worked anyway there was space um the one of the other things i do is um 
Richard has this book out, Everyday Seeing, which is a quote a day by Douglas Harding. And I leave that book open all day. Um, so I will read that quote several times in a day. Um, that's another thing I do. And during the process of, I think of it as downloading headlessness. Like, you know, like at first I would forget about being headless. And for me, the most visceral difference between headlessness and thinking I was a head, <laughs> um, that the mind was everything, um, was that the state of headlessness is so spacious. And feeling like you have a head and your thoughts predominate, for me, it was very constricting. So that's like a cue to me. If I'm feeling that constriction, I forgot that I'm space for the world. Mm. And it's as easy as this, check. And there was like one period when I kept checking. Like, did I lose the headlessness? No, it's still here. Like it didn't feel real and I had to keep doing that. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you, Becky. Ah, Amarinato. So I've, uh, I dedicated a huge part of my life to uh, Vipassana meditation <laughs> and I've done many, many retreats and, um, and, uh, and I can sort of sympathize with the grief that one has to go through after you've dedicated so much time to a practice which actually you can sort of do immediately now. You know, you point here, that's it, it's finished. So there, and there, so there's such a big investment, you know, and uh, when you practice that type of uh, meditation, your attention is being trained in a particular way. So it's sort of like you're focusing on the body or an object, and uh, and here that there is no object; it's just pure subjectivity. You know, it's just this is it. So uh, moving from a sort of vipassana practice, how how might you do that? One of the ways I found really helpful is to open your eyes because usually we're asked to close our eyes and bring attention inwards and then usually that can bring you to set to your like your physical sensations and then that really brings you with a sense of a concrete sort of an identity and it bring and if you practice a lot of the passion will bring you into the observer mind you know, and the observer mind is just another construct of the mind it's just another part of your ego it's fancy but it's it's still doing something so the ability to sort of let that go as well is another part of that grieving process <laughs> that that all that time that you spent cultivating something that's observing something else that one has to that one has to be relinquished has to be uh, has to be uh, um, put aside and the way that you may, you may want to use your mindfulness practice is your mindfulness pr practice becomes actually a bit like what Becky was saying actually just remembering who you are it's just a basic practice of saying, oh, yeah, oh, can I see my face? No, I can't. You know, a lot of people that seem to be asking questions, you know, about their, are there sort of like multiple steps or things, but this, here it is, isn't it? I mean, if I just look now, I, I can't see my face, you know, and it seems like me and Karen are looking at the same space, and yet when I turn to her, of course, I can see, I can see Karen. But, you know, and then, I, and then I can think, oh, well, I want a body sweep, you know, if you've done Goanka practice, you know. So then the mind goes into, oh, I want to sweep through my body because it gives nice, pleasant sensations. But it's still got nothing to do with what's going on, going on here. So uh, it's uh, just in a, a sort of a, a sense of a, also having to let go of a formal practice. Mm. You know? uh, it's great to use it. They're all really good to look after the body and stay healthy and keep in check and even dealing with stress and anxiety can be all those practices that can be really helpful but they don't liberate the mind they, they build upon it so you see you have to also have an inquiry into that it's just a little suggestion <laughs> mm, thank you thank you ah christine so there was an earlier question about children and um, I just 
feel like I can answer this one because I have Jade who's 19 years old. Um, and the first retreat that I ever took her to, she was 16 because what happened was I wasn't even going to bring her to the headless retreat, but my, um, babysitting situation fell through and then she ended up coming along just kind of as a happenstance and I never forced seeing upon her I never um, pushed it because I really really do think that children they can be exposed to it but I don't think it's it's good to like force something on them and I really think that um, because I let her develop in her own way and come to it on her own, like she, she still doesn't come to weekly Zoom meetings. And I, I don't mind, you know, that's, it's entirely her choice. So um, do you want to talk about your art, Jade, and what sure. you do and stuff like that? Yeah, so... Um... Last semester in my college classes, I had taken a ceramics course. Um, and our ceramics teacher, he's really passionate about, about like climate change um, and like kind of like helping the environment in like small ways that we can as like each individual people. Um, and then like as a whole too, like our class, like he had all of us group into little teams um, and come up with like um, an imaginary like kind of machine, I guess, to like help with the climate. Um, and change something so that we can like make the earth a better place um, and another team they came up with the idea um, for well our team was like more like um, we created like um, kind of like bio urns um, so when you pass away you can get cremated and then be planted as a tree sort of like the idea that they already have out there but we were thinking more like um, like a grove of trees or like a specific area like instead of a cemetery where they just have like coffins they would have like maybe like trees instead like a sacred forest kind of thing so I thought that was a really cool idea um, and so we made our project based on that but the other team I was really interested in I took a picture of it um, it's they focus more on the idea of like the human like capabilities so this if you can see it um, they built these little masks. So it's like a sculpture that they were thinking of setting up in the public um, and that you would actually sit down, stare into the mask, look at the other person um, because I guess the eyes are like the view into the soul. And so if you're looking at someone else's eyes, like you can really like feel them and like be them. And so that was super interesting because like, um, instead of like working on like the environment we were then working on ourselves to change and better ourselves. So I kind of, when she showed me that picture, I was like, oh, that's so headless. There's these people with these masks. And to me, it's like recognizing that we are our bodies and we're not, we just have bodies. You know, we, we are, okay, let me, let me rephrase that. <laughs> we who we really are is this open, spacious awareness that is the capacity for the world. We're the emptiness that is open for everything. So we're empty and full. So we're emptiness and fullness. And I thought that, that the two masks with the faces looking through the two masks was really depicting that two-way um seeing that we we have bodies and we we are not bodies and i thought it was a beautiful representation of that where um while recognizing that there is no separation between the two mm. yeah space and no face as well yeah yes and then do you feel like it was helpful, Jade, that I didn't push this on you? Like, do you want to yeah. just speak to that for the questions? Um, yeah, so it's good. It's like you can like kind of like understand your own kind of ways of thinking about it. Like, it's good to have like that kind of information at first. So you know that there's like people out there in a community that like understands these kinds of things. Um, but I would definitely say like if you have kids that you want to introduce it to, like just give them the ideas and resources. Or then, oh, you should do this, you know. It's like, <laughs> they'll be like, oh, I don't know about that one. 
And the time that I in introduced it to my 13 year old son, he was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> I already knew that. Like it was no big deal. He, he already knew that. He was like, yeah, like big deal. <laughs> it was very like, he just thought nothing of it. I think it's only when we've suffered and gone through things as adults that we need this resource. Sometimes kids are like, so what? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I saw a question just out the corner of my eye about, uh, I don't see it. Someone saying, I don't see it. And uh, I think it's worth just underlining that briefly, that if, what, what are we talking about? Can you see your own face now? You can't. Instead, you see the world, I'm sure. That's it. It's not feeling, it's not understanding. Feeling and understanding are important, how you respond to it. But uh, what often puts people off or th makes them think they haven't got it is because they don't feel anything. Well, there's nothing to feel here. But the question is, is it true? And do you want to live from the truth? I suppose is one question there anyway. So anything anyone wants to say, or, or Amir and Jade, another question? Please, please. Uh, Hi, um, just to say something about somebody has commented, I can see my face, I can see my nose, my eyebrow, my upper lips, my tongue, and my upper cheek. <laughs> ah. Oh no, it's all gone wrong. <laughs> Would someone like to respond to that? Yes, um, of course I can, I can see sort of nose in fact but it's really a shadow you know going from the the um, uh, below to the height you know it's not really something solid and in fact the question for me the important question for me is to realize that nobody is seeing here there is no observer no seer can you see the seer in fact uh, above your shoulder there is nobody you know there is just a space for the world and for everything. So, um, of course, you can see a little sh shadow here, you can uh, maybe see your eyebrows, but um, there is no observer. You know, it's, it's, it's very strange, I mean, it's a mystery. Um, nobody is looking, nobody is, it's, um, nobody is thinking, nobody is hearing, but there, there is vision, there is hearing, and that's a mystery. I can't understand it, but truly I see it, yes. I want to say that uh, what I used to to say is that there is two sides. Two sides. There is a one side with the with the face. This is the uh, l'envers, the outside. Yes, it's true. And the other side, the other side is uh, the the center side. So it's true in a certain way that uh, there is a face but it's not on the center side on the uh, outside long. yes 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 hank mm -hmm. hank and then judy yeah i know when i look out at the screen here you can't see it uh, uh the the attendees but but uh, the people here there's about 13 faces 12 or 13 faces I think they can see everyone. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Well, they are all clearly faces. There's, I have no doubt that they are faces. They're, uh, whatever the description of faces are, that's what they are. When I look here, whatever it is I see, maybe I see an eyebrow, maybe I see an upper lip, maybe I see a nose or something, but whatever it is, that's here, when I direct my attention here, it's not like what's there. That much is obvious. What is it like there then, Hank, for you? Then I can describe it and I can say, it's like one big window, one big transparent window that I'm looking out of, or it's like one boundless space all sorts of ways of describing it, and each of us probably have a different way of describing it. But whatever it is, it's not what I see there. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> Judy. 
Judy and then John. Douglas had a marvelously uh, dramatic way of talking about this, I always thought. And um, since I was a biology teacher, it appealed to me a great deal. Um, when we look at someone else's face, even if they're our nearest and dearest, if we are really, really honest, we know that that face is made of flesh and blood and bone and gristle and bodily fluids. <laughs> and that if we were to go and examine that uh, head over there really, really carefully, that's exactly what we would find. And Douglas used to say, we would find a meatball, a meatball. Now, are you looking out of a meatball at this moment? And if you say yes, well, I guess I've got to um, accept that that's what it's like. It's where you are is all gooey and liquid, dark, and um, not not probably very pleasant. Whereas in my experience, and I think in everyone else's experience, if they're, if they're prepared to be uh, to not think but to look, it is as Hank just said. A clear window, a clear, a clarity in which the world is suspended. All the things in the world are suspended in this clarity, which has no boundaries, no edges, and which is not something. It's certainly not a meatball. Well, I'm having no meatball. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> John. Um, <coughs> Yes, uh, Hank, uh, Shakespeare had a go at uh, describing it. He called it our glassy essence. It's not a bad effort, really. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> the, um, if you go on the, uh, the Headless Way website, there's an experiment to address every single one of the objections that one might have to uh, this insight that here I'm openness uh, rather than a body of thing. Okay, and uh, there are you know 15, 20 uh, experiments. If you click on the link to the experiments, you'll find them all there. And uh, if you can find someone to do them with, that's brilliant. Okay, uh, but you know they are they are the the bedrock of all our experiences, doing, actually doing the, uh, the experiments. Commend them. Yes, Karen. Uh, it's, it's so, it, every time I'm just blown away, I'm so super astonished that actually here is nothing. You know, when I put my hands behind my head, they disappear in, I don't know what, but they're really gone. And all the qualities that I can give out to things in the world and ama and, you know, whatever, nothing, nothing uh, I can describe to this. I, mean, I can say, you know, it's an open window, somebody said, it's glossy essences but uh, you know these words are just an attempt to describe something indescribable and uh, it's astonishing and it's such a relief to admit there's nothing here you know this whole person that uh, that I always in the outside world admit oh yes that's me here she doesn't exist it's hmm. not even a she <laughs> There's not even existing. It's it's just it blows you away, does it? And it's such freedom. Well, freedom, another word. Such a relief. She's Thank not you. here. Thank you, Lorraine. Yes. What I want to say is that uh, uh, what is important to see is that the, the to um, uh, identific identificate to a face is a prescription. And uh, it's not uh, given by experience because when we were very, very young, we didn't uh, uh, identify. identify. 
with yeah. this space. And at the, on the same time, you can see that the, the body, when you close the eyes and when you, you, you put your attention on the body sensation, you can see that there is no form to the body sensation. There is a lot of things that are very, uh, uh, we can be astonished by, by this thing because uh, we used to, to think a lot of, we have a lot of idea about ourselves. But if we uh, conf confront the, the experiments, if we experiment the real uh, things, we see that we enter in a world who is very different because the body sensations are wide open, they, they are no form, they, are, they, they take all the place in the consciousness. And, uh, I think that to answer to that question, you have to experiment. Mm, very good. Jade and Amir, did you see other things uh, there? And you, do you and Jade have any any things you want to share about living the headless life? I I've been quite busy. There's yeah. a surprising number of questions and comments coming in, so I'm quite yeah busy in like reception mode. Yeah. Um, all I all I can say is back here nothing is there's still nothing happening. But out here there's <laughs> two screens and lots of questions and comments and technical things going on. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I just thought I'd share one other thing that's come up quite a few from quite a few people who are maybe this is their first exposure to headlessness or they're feeling like they're not getting it or they're a beginner and want more guidance. So again, I don't know if you wanted to um, point them in. The, and I think a few people have been doing that in the comment section, either point people to resources where they can s start with this or do an experiment for people who are very, very new to this. Um, Okay. And then there are other questions coming from people who have obviously done this a little yeah. bit or done it for a while. I, I think, um, first of all, there are lots of resources, like John here does a Monday evening workshop online that is free. So that is one way forward where you can go through the experiments. And uh, if you need information about that, you just go to the headless.org website and on the home page, you'll see in the news section, information about those weekly workshop workshops of course there's a lot on the website and we have regular zoom meetings five six seven a week which are free and just contact me through the the, the uh, website but ju just uh, we can all do this uh, just you just one very simple experiment which is directing your attention and you need to use your finger so yeah no one's watching <laughs> point at somebody on the screen at their face you see you're directing your attention so this is extremely simple you're directing your attention out and you can see their face and they've got a background and the colors and shapes and movement now you turn your finger around and probably don't look at the screen now just look at your finger and point back at where others see your face what do you see i can say that for me i don't see a face i don't see a background uh, just an open space. It's a non-verbal experience, so I'm sure you've got it. You'll describe it in your own way. And that's what we're talking about. <laughs> Shock horror. Um, we have a, a question here. Um, oh, sorry, did you want to speak, Amara? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to, to say, uh, you know, the, this, this turning the finger back here, this is our culture, everything is always, always pushing us outwards. And so this, you know, to um, shift our attention around is also sort of like it's, it's anti-culture because it, all marketing, advertising, newspaper, the way the coronavirus is being spread is all about bringing your attention outwards. And so to, to uh, reorient, uh, reorientate yourself, you know, and sometimes uh, for the new, you know, for those that are new to it and they struggle with it, it takes some time to keep shifting that, even though the, it's so simple, to keep shifting oneself back. And so you like, it's, it's not like in sort of classical mind, mindfulness, you know, you can sort of beat yourself up about trying to, I've got to get it right. But the thing is, is just to keep trying and experimenting and seeing to, is what is actually here right now. 
because the world put, is always put our attention is always outward you know and so many so much of our lives is always focused outwards and just to keep reminding ourselves just what what here you know that's it yes jose uh, yes the experiment we just did for me is, is a key of this teaching for me because it's you know we have to turn back our attention here uh, 180 degree back to the source and uh, Amar Hanato uh, is right we always look this direction and we, for, we forget to look back here to the source and it's so simple so simple I remember once in Paris Douglas came for a workshop and with a lot of people maybe 150 and uh, he, he just began in saying that you know it's so simple that it is embarrassing to be all together here for for this uh, workshop because it's so simple so we we think maybe because we have we have read some books that it's difficult to see our true nature but nothing is more simple and it's for everybody you don't need to be a monk uh, you don't need to be a philosopher you don't need you don't need to be some, some somebody special uh, you don't need to have powers i mean it's so simple just look above your shoulder and you will find space an open space awakening space and everything is coming in it and so you got it everybody got it yes yes becky and J judy i found it helpful um to reflect on how we came to learn that we have a head in the first place. That, you know, like I didn't realize this when it was happening um, that I was becoming accustomed to my true nature, but to see myself with a face, like I'm looking at myself in the screen now and to believe that that's who I am, I had to learn that. It didn't just happen. And um, I, I, of course, have no memory of it, but I worked really hard at learning that. And um, I'm laughing because, Richard, the first time you described this, it made me laugh so much that, you know, somebody taught you that reflection in the mirror, and then you had to turn it around and somehow juxtapose it up on your shoulders. And then you came to believe that's who you were. But when we go like this, the question is, who do I see that I am? Not who do all of you see that I am? Not who have I been told that I am? But what, what do I see? Hmm. And then the irony is we're taught not to point. <laughs> what you might discover if you point, it's not polite to point. <laughs> You're being impolitely aware. <laughs> Judy, did you want to say something? No, I did. Um, just think back how many years it took you to learn to put your face on. You know, from when you were a tiny baby, uh, didn't have one, and then you learned about the mirror, and then you learned that this person was you in the mirror and all that stuff. And when you were at school, uh, people told you what you were like and who you are and how you should behave. And all the way in your adolescence, when you had to make your way with others of your same age, and you had to be a person, you had to be somebody, and then you were an adult and you gain, you have to be somebody to get a job. And we, we invest so much in, in our personhood and we have to as human beings, otherwise we don't function. But we forget that what's behind this is this uh, timeless clarity, um, which is none of those things. And um, when I when I first met Douglas, um, I I kept thinking, oh, I haven't got it. It's got to be something more than this. It, it can't be just this. I haven't got it. I haven't got it. And I would have to go back and 
talk some more, do some more experiments, and come back to the simplicity of this. And it, it's very difficult to be simple enough just to accept that this is how I am. And it's taken many years of deconditioning. You know, like when you've been a deep sea diver and you come back up again, you've got to spend, um, you've got to get rid of all those bubbles of nitrogen in, in the bloodstream. And I think it's rather similar. They, they, they bubble away and this, which is so natural, is how we, all, we are always, but it's, it's the familiarity um, uh, helps. So I don't think we should, I think we should be wary of thinking, oh, it's got to be uh, something that I haven't got yet. Mm. And the other thing, of course, is we're gen generally, we're as human beings, um, the idea of self-improvement is pretty much ingrained. And we all have the feeling it's got to make me into this, it's got to make me a nicer person or whatever it is that we think is wrong with us. Um, but actually, you can kind of come back to accept your humanness just as it is, and then it changes bit by bit. Well, one of my reflections on uh, presenting uh, in these webinars is we're just ordinary people. We're not no one special, but we've all got it, and everyone, uh, no one can see their own face, and I hope that. Uh, we can encourage all of you uh, listening and watching uh, that, it, that, it, that you've got it. You can't see your face and uh, something like that. <laughs> yes, Christine. So having been involved in this, I think I said since 2004, but I think it was more like 2014, I was thinking about, but that didn't make sense. <laughs> but um, so just over these last six or seven years, um, I've struggled between the doing and the non-doing. And that is even a struggle with me um, overcoming my cancer diagnosis. There's a kind of this fine balance that I need to find between um, pushing and doing some exercises and mobility things for my arm because I had lymph nodes removed and making it all swollen and making it worse and going backwards. There's a fine line between doing and not doing because um, I've also found that to be true in seeing. And when I do nothing and just allow this to kind of be happening, because you know we're always seeing all the time, then sometimes I just forget. And I could be teaching in my classroom and be um, kind of like not aware of my true face, like the face before I was born, as they say in, in Zen. But then when I do attend the weekly Zoom meetings and I do certain practices, it helps me remember and then when I'm teaching at the front of my classroom, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm, I am these 30 students and I have more compassion and I realize that we're all connected and I'm a kinder, more tuned in teacher because there's just less separation between my students and myself. And I'm just kind of in the flow more, especially when I'm, you know, it doesn't mean that I have to be aware of my true face 24 seven. But th I think that there's this whole Sam Harris, small glimpses many times of Locke Kelly. There's different teachers who point you to this, but at the same time, you it's so simple. And it's like being a little avatar in a video game. When I'm walking and I see these arms, when I'm walking and I see the 
trees flowing in and I'm going past a fence and the fence posts are coming into this space, this aware space, it's a reminder of who I really, really am, that I'm not this little avatar body, that I'm the awareness that's so spacious and capacious and is open for what's happening. I'm like the unscreen. It's so easy to describe what it's not versus what it is. I'm, I'm the mystery that, that cannot be named. Mm -hmm. And so when you're driving, it's easy to be driving and just make your peripheral vision really wide and just notice that you're not going anywhere as awareness. The scene is moving into you. And just continuing to do those little practices because yes, um, my fiance has seen this, has seen his headless nature, but he doesn't do anything about it. It doesn't mean much to him. But whereas I kind of find that balance between doing and not doing and just kind of, it's like, can I do practices? Can I do these exercises like this and this or twirling or doing all the things that are recommended on the headless.org website? There's all these pointers that can keep bringing it back and bringing it back and bringing it back versus you know, do I just do nothing because I already am everything. I did 20 years of meditation. I did buy 10,000 books and read 10,000 books and did searching, 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 searching. And it was like so exhausting and expensive. And it's like, oh, it was this easy all along. All I had to do was go come home to myself. I just came home to myself and go, oh, I'm home. So. Mm -hmm. Welcome home. <laughs> Lauren. Uh, thank you, Christine. I really like what uh, you just said. And uh, I, I like this notion of flow. I think it's very important. And uh, uh, at the beginning, maybe I thought that identification was a problem. Or, uh, but there is, there is no problem. Uh, the, you have to, to, to be one with life. And the, the way to be one with life is uh, just to see here. And when you see here, there is no separation between uh what what you what is inside what is it's uh, it's really the because we we did this uh at, at uh, 10 minutes ago but we can add this it's uh there is two directions and in these two directions are one there is no obst obstacle in this. obstacle yeah okay thank you sorry uh, my english is uh, Terrible, but... Uh, oh, it's very good, Lauren. Very good. <laughs> Charming accent, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> Karen. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's, it's uh, this utter simplicity, this coming home, this just what I am is actually this moment. Uh, everything happening here, uh, the sounds, the 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 the, the vision, uh, and that's it. Period. That's it. <laughs> you can think about it for a long time, but it won't bring you here. Okay, Jane, Amir, any any other questions to jump out for you there? Yeah, we had one quite a while back. Um, do you ever feel a burning sense of need to tell others about this, but are afraid that they will think you're crazy? <laughs> Can you answer that one, Jade? 
I tell them whether they think I'm crazy or not. <laughs> 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 Just keep going. Um, and I guess when explaining to people who don't realize they're headless, um, I didn't get it at first. I was like, I'm pointing at my finger. I, didn't, I don't see this nothing that everyone's speaking about. But I guess practicing it daily or just integrating it into my daily life has kind of made me realize that I have no head, even though I, it was always there anyway. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sequoia and then Lauren. Sequoia? Yeah. Um, I, uh, there's no desire here to share with others. Um, it, it just doesn't come up. Um, living from it, I think is the biggest teacher. Um, expressing it in your interactions with others. Um, uh, and that is how this expresses and, and teaches those around you. Thank you, Lauren. Yes, I, I want to say that uh, uh, maybe if you begin with the closed eyes, maybe it's easier for, for people who really don't know about uh, meditation because uh, it's usual. On the, but the closed eye, the headless closed eye is different because uh, there is a question about uh, your identity. So there is a link to the, to the headless, uh, to the open eye. I think uh, if you want to share that with people who really don't know, maybe you can start with the exercise uh, close eyes. Ready for another question? Yep. Um, what about the feeling of shame in this process? And other people have mentioned other emotions. Shame seems to make me a thing again, puts me back into this person. What is your experience? I think for, I'll, I'll go and then Emma. Uh, I think that my own discovery uh, is that uh, in truth, no feeling gets in the way of seeing my no face. Uh, now, this doesn't make the feeling go away, uh, certainly not immediately. So I feel shame, I feel sadness or fear or anxiety. But the, the question is, I suppose, as I'm asking, is not how to get rid of that feeling, but who am I? Am I a thing here uh, feeling shamed? Or am I space for that feeling? And I find when I look now that my feelings are arising in the space along with what's going on in the screen. And here I'm empty for it. And uh, I, I, I think that uh, it's for each of us to uh, see whether these feelings really do get in the way of seeing who we are. I find they don't. Yeah. Don't make them go away uh, straight away. But yeah, I'm off. Yeah, I, I guess uh, all, like with those very uh, strong emotions is to see whether, you know, if they keep uh, repeating even within, the, even within the space and then sometimes they, they for me personally and because I also work as a coach, uh, that, um, that sometimes you need other tools. Yeah, although, although they'll, they can come into the big space that sometimes they require uh, another look at your identity um, and to see maybe there's, um, so I would say something uh, developmentally uh, that needs to be explored and, uh, and find some way of, uh, of uh, working with that. So it, it, in like, in like in meditation, it's like, you know, sometimes you can have a physical pain just, uh, because you sat wrong or you can have a physical pain because actually there's something wrong with your leg <laughs> and uh, it, if there's something wrong with your leg sometimes you need a bit of uh, extra su extra um, uh, support and uh, you know to work out where that is and that's my uh, my, my mm. personal experience of it yeah 
I'll just add a, a variation to this question. So, so, you know, for one person, shame takes them out, for another person, a headache. You know, it's very hard to feel headless when there's a headache, as another example of something that seems to change it. Well, I, I get headaches, migraines, uh, and um, I know what you mean, uh, they're, they're awful. But the, uh, you know, if, if you, as I said earlier, I think this is an opportunity in that moment to practice attention and see whether the headache really is, does cover over the space. It doesn't. It does not make the headache go away. Uh, but this is for exploring. And the, I find uh, life gets more and more challenging, whether it's headaches or, you know, what's happening in the world at the moment. Life does not get easier in my experience, but it calls on me in this new challenging situation, whether it's a headache or shame or coronavirus, to step up and attend to who I am. Just it face to no face, it's coronavirus to no coronavirus, it's headache, uh, it's shame to none. Uh, this is a personal thing, but it is, when, when you, when, what other response are you going to have, really? You know, anyway, that, that's my response. Uh, the opportunity in this, in this situation right now, in the webinar, is, is to be aware of my true nature. Yeah. Uh, what, so what, comes up, yeah. what, what comes up for me is that through, through headlessness um, over the years, there's less and less desire to change what's coming up regardless of what it is. There's less of a felt need to make it be different than what it is and to, to honor what's showing up instead of trying to get rid of it or to alter it in any way. Thank you. Jose? Yes, we, we all have difficulties in life, difficulties we are with our bodies, with our relationships with uh, every with our feelings um, but these difficulties are opportunities to look to um, who have who, who has these difficulties I remember Douglas said the um, difficulties of the little one are the opportunities of the big one the big one is the this clear emptiness I mean if we if we uh, have if we have no problem in our life we will never look back to the source. We will stay in the little one. We will stay in the ego. So thanks to our, to our difficulties, you know, because they, they push uh, us to look here to the source, to find peace and relief. I think, well, in my life, it was um, the difficulties of my life which pushed me to find the true answer. And the true answer is our true nature. Mm. Becky. Um, yeah, just to add to this conversation, I find that sometimes the way this plays out for me is after having been in a situation that was challenging, I'll think to myself, oh, that would have gone better if I had remembered <laughs> headlessness. <laughs> you know, like... The realization that I wasn't making space for what was going on. I wanted the negativity to be gone because I want to be happy all the time. Something that's that's been really powerful here is is the statement, know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And this is the truth. And it doesn't say know the truth and and do all kinds of stuff and, and clear up your conditioning. It says, know the truth and the truth shall set you free. This, this knowing is what sets mm. freedom in motion. Yeah. We've got about seven minutes left. There's uh, still lots of great questions that have come through that 
we, we probably won't have time to get to. So maybe it's a good time for a practical one. Before ending, can any of the panelists holding local gatherings please tell us where and when? So I think Zoom calls will be mentioned a lot, but maybe people are spread out around the world here. Um, or how to get on the email list for alerts and gatherings. Uh, Jose and Lauren, do you want to say what you do in Paris? Yes, but uh, it, it is in French. Uh, so we are giving workshop in, in our apartment twice a month, and I'm, I, um, I'm traveling all, all around France and Belgium and Switzerland to give workshop, but in French. So I, I don't know if our friend here can um, understand French. Mm. Yeah. And in summer, we do uh, a one, with, week, one week of... Uh, one week workshop, yes. Yeah. Mm. With Catherine. And yes, Catherine Arnold. Down in the south somewhere, isn't yes, it? Yes, in the south of France. Yeah. And so usually there is English friends. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. Huh? And how do people find out more about this? Sorry if you mentioned it, but I didn't catch. You have a website or a... Yeah, Vivre Sans Tête, is it? Or v what's your oh, website? Yes, um, yes, 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 there's a French website. Vivre Sans Tête, yes, which is translation of on having no head. Yes, and you, you can you can find a lot of uh, video uh, with Douglas in English, of course, and Catherine and, uh, and Richard and a lot of articles, but in French. Yeah. Hello. Yes, I'm coming um, in May uh, near Geneva, yes. If the coronavirus allow yeah. us to travel, I will be there in May. <laughs> um, Karen, uh, in... Uh... Hello, Holland. Yes, I'm in Holland. Unfortunately, uh, next week, uh, weekend, I was going to have a, a workshop which can't happen. The center closed down and we just he heard before this uh, uh, webinar was starting that the clothes are, uh, schools are closing down and uh, everything is closing down. So uh, the next one hopefully happening will be in Holland in Lelystad which is about the cent center of Holland on the Sunday June 14th and uh, my website is headlesscafe.info and uh, but also I'm on the big website on the uh, workshops worldwide. And uh, if you go to our uh, website and go to workshops, you'll see lots of information there. And we have uh, you know seven or eight regular free online Zoom meetings. And uh, to get more information about that, email me. If you just go to the website. Uh, you will uh, find my address, their contact. And we just do, we don't just put it out for everyone. We want people who are interested, who've done some experiments, you know, but you're very welcome if you're interested to, to drop in and join us there. And we have an American gathering in August and the English one in July. And John does the Monday evening online workshop. So there's lots on offer. Uh, for you, so uh, um, and we, you know, what we're interested in is making friends, uh, not students, not uh, clients, but friends who are sharing this. That this is uh, inspiring to, and and it's inspiring to to meet you and to hear from you, which we can't do very well in this format. But uh, Judy, you've got your hand up there. Uh, I, there might be somebody who's within reach of South Wales, um, and I run over the winter. I run fortnightly uh, courses called Universe Explorer. But um, also, if there are enough uh, people who are interested, a monthly uh, just get together for sharing and talking and generally uh, being with each other. This is going to be more difficult in the next few months, obviously, but. Um, it will it will start again hopefully in the summer autumn. And how do people find out about that one, Judy? Uh, well, that's a good question um, because I haven't I done anything. Put it on the website. But, yeah, Richard, uh, I'll do that. I'll give Richard the detail. And uh, also, I'm doing things at the Psychedelic Society, which Amir 
and Jade are involved with. Do you want to say anything about that, Damir? Um, yeah, so obviously a lot of our events are not as secure in terms of because of the coronavirus, but generally speaking, we organize um, a lot of events, many of which are on, on these topics and several recently, and we hope to have many more with Richard, uh, courses and workshops and little gatherings, and that's in East London. Um, when it looks like we can very um, confidently uh, host more events without fear of them being cancelled, uh, then we hope to put them together in other parts of London as well, but for now they're in East London. And I posted the website for that in the chat, psychedelicsociety.org.uk. Thank you. This is the Universe Explorer model, which is now available. Uh, you can order it via the website, so it just uh, shows you all your layers. Uh, so it's a wonderful thing. So that's a little bit of uh, promotion there. All right. Well, we're just about the end of it. Just thank you, all the panelists, so much. It's just been a uh, wild, lovely to be with you. Yeah. And thank you for all of you who have uh, turned up and asked wonderful questions and just supported us and enjoyed being the space together, which is one. So, you know, we're all in this together and we're here to celebrate and share this very simple direct way home to our true nature. And uh, we're all learning as we go along here. Yeah. Anyone want to say a final thing before we finish here? Silence is gone. I just, I just like to say thank you to everyone, and, and um, it's been a wonderful opportunity to meet with all the panelists. I learned so much and and grow so much from everybody's experience of of their true nature. And thank you all. Well, you speak for us all, as of course. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody, and we will close this.